All right, so welcome to the abridged last lecture. Um, this, years ago, used to be a three-lecture topic when this course was only for one subgroup of students. And now that CP also has it, we discovered that we don't need to teach us in a lot of detail because you guys learn it in your level, well, your second database course. So what's the point of covering it in detail? Uh, however, just for making sure at least, you know, the basic concepts have been planted in your brains before, I cover it in a very succinct manner. And the topic is functions and triggers. Um, all database servers have the ability to be programmed. And this comes along with um, the ability to create your own functions, just like you would in Java. Um, it also has something called triggers, which are as point in time code. In other words, when certain things happen in the database server, it fires off code and runs it. Different database servers implement different levels of it. Every server practically has its own language, literally. No two servers share the same language. Uh, Postgres and Oracle are the two closest to each other because they, went, uh, they did it on purpose to make sure that Postgres and Oracle's languages were comparable, but they're still not quite the same because, you know, can't be 100% identical because Oracle might sue you, you know, so. So, I just finished talking about that. So, in... When you talk about programming the database, which so far you guys have been communicating with the database, not programming the database, right? You gave it instructions, it did it, it told you what happened. You were basically having a conversation with the database. It's just like talking to a kid. Can you please go clean up your room? And it may ha might happen, it might not happen, depending on how you asked and how they were threatened, right? Or you could say to somebody else, you know, how many drinks from Tim Hortons did you drink th today? They may or may not tell you, depending on how you phrase your questions. You know, that kind of stuff. When you're programming, there are three p potential places you can program. There's functions, stored procedures, and triggers. Functions and stored procedures are essentially the same thing. Their definition is what define is, is different. And then there's triggers, which I'll cover a, b a bit later. Postgres is kind of cool, because most database servers offer you one language. Oracle has... Uh, PLSQL. Um, IBM DB2 has its own language. I don't remember what it's called. MySQL has a language called Runtime because they're really original. Um, Microsoft SQL Server has, actually, Sybase has Transact SQL, which is shared by Microsoft SQL Server to a certain degree. Microsoft SQL Server also finally gave us C Sharp, which is nice. Um, Postgres, on the other hand, is the other way around where they decide, you know what, not any one language is perfect for the job, so let's give you as many languages as we can possibly can. So there's PGSQL, which is 90% compatible with Oracle's. So, you know, if you learn Oracle, you learn this one, you're most of the way there for the other one. Uh, TCL, which is pretty much a dead language. Um, it still has its place. It has a few things it does well. Uh, you can write your functions in Perl if you like to suffer. Um, but Perl is really good with working with strings. Therefore, that's why Perl's still there. And the last big one is Python. You can write your functions in Python, your trigger functions in Python, or even your functions in Python, and you can uh, do whatever you want with it using a language you're really comfortable with, and Python does an awful lot of stuff. Um, there's actually a few other languages. I just don't remember if I kept that slide in there or not, so I'll, tell, I'll say it off the top of my head. Uh, PL Java. Yes, you can write your stored fun procedures in Java and your functions in Java and your triggers in Java. You have to take into account the time one of those things gets fired off, it's got to fire off the GRE along for the ride. It's expensive. Unless you're trying to do something that's only Java can do, which, trust me, Python can do everything Java can do. Easier. Not necessarily better. It's things Java does well. Java scales. Python does not. So it has its place. Yeah, let's compare it to... A, yeah, no. No, but it's got to load a, lunch, a bunch of stuff first before it can happen. Pyth Python runs right away because the executables are already loaded in memory with Postgres. 
right? Whereas the other one's got to go, oh, this is defined in Java 1.3. I got to go find the 1.3 JRE. Does it exist? Yes. Let's load up the JRE. Now we'll compile it. Now we'll execute it. It's slower. But you can do it. It just doesn't mean, you know, but it has its place. There's certain things you can. Like you could actually have shared objects between your applications and the database server. So you use the same code in both places so that the rules are the same in both places. It has a spot. Now, functions versus stored procedures. In Postgres, before version 11, they were basically the exact same thing. In other servers, they weren't quite the same thing, but they basically, here's the difference. In. A function returns a value. You guys should know about this. In Java, normally a function returns a value unless it's a void function. There's no such thing as a void function in a database server. It has to return a value. The procedure does not return a value. It's like a batch file or a shell script. Even though it's written in the database's programming language, it's used for maintenance. So a procedure is a set of commands, but functions also have commands in them. But a procedure can alter the structure of the database. Functions should not. In other words, functions are you want to create a function that generates a password and encrypts it. That's what you can use it for. On the other hand, a stored procedure could be used to do maintenance, vacuuming the tables, uh, deleting old log files, del uh, archiving you know, dead records that you don't need anymore, maybe nightly running denormalization jobs for, for the reporting purposes. So you could actually you know, normalize uh, denormalize your data sets so that when they go run the reports the next day, they're, they're quicker. That's what stored procedures are for. Now, when you define a function, this is pretty much the same in every language. There's a command, there, but in SQL, the command is create function. Just like there's create table, create view, create index, create function. You give it a name, you define the arguments with the data types, you define the return type, define variables and code. You give it a return value and, and the code. Does that sound familiar? Because it's essentially the same. Actually, I will pull up a few examples towards the end so you can see what it looks like. But I just want to get through the, the actual slides first. Triggers is the one of the harder concepts for people to understand. Um, when I was going to school, there's like this new emerging programming concept called event-driven programming. It was a new thing. And just so you know, the new thing that was uh, propelling it forward was Visual Basic 2. We're going back a few years. But the concept of event-driven programming means you're writing code that responds to, to events. So for example, when you use your computer, you click on the Start menu, that's an event. You know, you move your mouse over a link on a web page and it might glow or it might change color. That's an event. You click on a button, that's an event. And you write code to respond to those events. Now, in most database servers, there are six moments that can be guaranteed that they will capture. A lot of servers offer more than just these basic six events. But the three major events are insert, update, and delete. Because those are things that happen, right? You insert data, you update the data, and you delete the data. So those are the three events. There's also two timing moments, before and after. So before you insert or after you insert, before or after you update, before or after you delete. Those are your six events that pretty much all servers support. Um, not talking about data, desktop database software like Access. We even Access has the ability to kind of do this. It's just written kind of weird. But pretty all transactional servers support those six. Um, some of them actually have before select. So you can actually fire off code before the select actually happens. So you can actually modify what's being selected. Um, there's also some where you can actually capture uh, DDL events, create table, create index. You can actually write triggers that intercept that. Um, usually that's usually used for replication. So if you're copying data from one server to another, you want to make sure that you know when that table gets created here, it gets created over there too. Uh, but these are the major ones. And depending on the database server, the trigger may or may not be part of a transaction. And 
I don't talk about transactions anymore because that's also covered in your second term. But essentially, a transaction is any time you, you ask the server to do something. You want to insert a da data, that's a transaction. And the trig since the triggers fire off with you know, the insert or the update, some servers treat them as part of the transaction and some don't. Postgres, for example, from the moment it receives to the command until it gives you the everything is good, that's treated as one block of execution. Whether it fires off three or four triggers, that's all part of the same thing. MySQL treats every piece as an individual transaction. So the before triggers, fire off, oh, that worked, yes, yay. Now I can do the insert. Did that work? Yay. The after trigger, did that work? No. Well, that's too bad because the rest of it worked, so the rest of it still applies. Postgres, if any of it failed, the whole thing fails. So it's a little more um, serious. Um, there is a flowchart on the slides that shows the, the actual process whenever triggers get fired. Um, the command gets received. It determines whether you're manipulating the data or not. By manipulating, that's insert, update, or delete. If it's not manipulating, it executes the query. If it worked, yay. Out goes the data, end of result. If it is manipulating data, it parses the query, double checks, make sure it's good. It checks if there's a before trigger. If it exists, it fires it. And did it succeed? Yes or no. If it doesn't, it blows up and tells you you suck. Otherwise, you know, it executes what you just asked it to do, so it'll do the insert. Did that work? Yes or no? If it works, great. If it doesn't, again, it blows up. You can see a lot, of, a lot more stuff goes to the red box than to the box at the end. And then it goes, is there an after trigger? Yes or no? Did it work? If it didn't, it bombs out. And if it's a sane database server, such as Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, even if... It reaches, hello mouse, oh, no. Even if I reach this point and it fails, it's as if none of this happened. With MySQL, if this fails, everything else before it still happened. So MySQL is like a four-year-old. Postgres is, you know, maybe an eight-year-old. Right, you say, you know, go do this, and they go do it, and if something goes horribly wrong, they just, as long as they got to that point, they're happy. That's the four-year-old, right? With the eight-year-old, they might get to the end, then you may or may not find out, find out something went wrong. But you know, you've got a better chance that they'll tell you something went wrong so you can give new instructions on how to handle the situation. See, the young people here don't understand what I'm talking about. The parents understand exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> right? Those of us that have had kids or have kids right now know exactly what I'm talking about, the lack of uh, feedback. Or the acceptance that, hey, I did two-thirds of the work right. That's good enough. Mom or dad will never notice that you know, the, the shed's on fire. <laughs> you know. Um, now I'm going to pull up a few examples just so I can show you guys what the code would look like if you were working with Postgres. This is how you define a function in Postgres. That first chunk right there. Actually, let's see if I can get it any bigger. I don't, oh, I can. But I, then I'm losing the outside edge. All right, that's as good as it's gonna get. So this is a dice roll function. This is something you probably learn in almost every language. And as you can see, you create function, you give it a name, you define your arguments with their data types. That so far looks kind of familiar to what you've seen before, potentially in Java. And then the return is actually after, so it tells you it's returning a Java, uh, returning an integer. Whereas you guys are probably used to seeing, you know, the the return type somewhere else, function, something else, right? Um, now this is what throws people that have never programmed with a database off as these double dollar signs. MySQL has got something similar. Microsoft SQL Server also has something similar. This can be anything. Well, basically, 
dollar sign anything dollar sign, just two dollar do dollar signs works. It's basically telling it from here on out until you see this exact same symbol a second time, ignore semicolons. Because what's the command terminator? Semicolon. So if this wasn't here, it would reach this point and say, oh, I'm done now. Because the semicolon is there. So this tells it ignore semicolons going forward. With MySQL, it's even dumber. You actually have to physically tell it ignore semicolons. There's like a, there's a backslash command, you feed it and you tell it, no, it's set delimiter, sorry, set delimiter equals and you give it something other than semicolon. And then once you finish creating your function, you set it back to the semicolon. It's really, really dumb. It's pretty terrible. Now, over here is, I'm declaring a variable at the beginning. Now, anybody here ever see a language called Pascal? Anybody here ever hear the word Pascal? Okay. In Pascal, you have to declare all your variables. Actually, it's really popular in certain parts of the world as a first programming language because it's so anal retentive. If you don't follow its rules, it really hates you. So it's a good way to learn how to program if the language is so strict. And Java is loose compared to Pascal. In Pascal, you have to declare all your variables at the top of the program file or at the top of the function. Otherwise, you cannot use the variables. You cannot declare a variable partway through the program. Postgres does the same thing. So you declare all your variables at the top. So this one here, I'm declaring something called total as an integer. And then I got a begin and an end block. This is telling it, you know, this is where the actual meat of the function is. I'm setting total to be equal to zero. As you notice, I got this weird set E set to something operator. Now in SQL, what's the equality operator? One equal sign, right? So how are you supposed to use that to assign a value? You can't because you'd be comparing all the time. So somebody had to come up with a way of saying, we're going to assign a value here, so let's go with colon equals. That's assignment operator. They were winging it. That's why a lot of people like using Python or Perl because then it looks like the language you're used to working with. And then I got a for loop. You guys know what for loops are, I hope, by now. The syntax is completely different than anything you've ever seen. Uh, actually, it looks like basic, to be more precise. Yeah, pretty much. It's every non-C-like language looks pretty much like this. So basic, Pascal, Turing, it all looks roughly like this. Python, kind of. So it's 4i in, and then you see this one, two dots, number of dice. This is actually declaring a range it's between one and whatever this is. And then you'd say it's going to loop from here, and in there I'm just doing the usual random. I showed you guys how to do random already. I end the loop. You guys are used to seeing this as open curly, close curly. Then I return a value. I end my code block. I reset my delimiter. I'm telling it explicitly that I'm using PLPGSQL, which is the, the default language in Postgres. And that's how you define a function. Now, I could go select FN random numbers and give it, feed it two different values, and they would just return you at one number. So you could use it to play D&D &D if you wanted, if you want to ex go extra nerdy. Um, As you can see, you can also declare lots of variables. That's a different function. That randomly generates a PIN number. I'll actually post this on Brightspace for you guys to actually dissect at your heart's content. Um, but essentially, I'm just randomly generating a bunch of things in here. The only thing that's really different in here is this. You guys are used to be able to set a breakpoint, right? When you want to see what's happening in your program, you're in your Java. ID, you hit a breakpoint, you go run in debug mode. It's a breakpoint, your code stops, you can inspect your variables. Guess what you can't do in a database server? You can't pause your code. You can't put in breakpoints. So what Ray's notice does is it returns it to whatever's operating as a notice. It's not an error, it returns it as a notice. So you'll get like a log with all the values. So it'll output it separately, not part of the regular output, it'll output it to the secondary stream. Uh, when you guys learn Java, uh, Linux next term, you'll learn about redirecting your outputs. This is basically what this is. You're redirecting the output in two different places. Uh, 
and that is user defined functions. Um, I'm going to try to find a short trigger. Okay, now in Postgres, because this is the examples I have, Postgres is one of the best databases to work with triggers. People that use Postgres abuse triggers significantly. Why? Because they're actually implemented properly. Um, other database servers are kind of special. For example, MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server used to be like this. I'm not sure if it still is because I haven't played with newer versions. Oracle, last I heard, was still like this. Um, when you define a trigger, the code of the trigger must be contained within the trigger definition. That means for every event you want to capture, you have to define a trigger for it. So if you have a before insert and a before update, you have to define two different triggers for it and write the code twice. Now, what happens if you discover a bug in your trigger? That means you gotta go change it in two places. Three places, four places, maybe all over the place, depending on what it is you're trying to do. <coughs> maybe you're trying to put in auditing triggers so that when things get inserted and updated, you actually wanna keep track of what's going on and you have to add it to every table. That means you'd have, you know, if a database with 100 tables, you'd have 100 triggers to maintain. Postgres encourages code reuse. So you can define a function and then just declare it everywhere instead. So in this case, it's a function that tracks serial number changes. And there's actually a history. This is actually a real trigger from where I work, my day job. Uh, there's actually history behind this trigger. Uh, I hate the Dutch because of it. I'm kidding. But I actually hate Amsterdam because of this trigger. And I'll tell you the story why this kind of stuff is important in a minute. But you define the function just like you always would. You notice there's no arguments. And it returns a trigger. And so instead of returning an integer or a var car, it returns a trigger. It's returning an object. And the, tr the bid begins. And what happens here is it's you know, setting a last modified date to the current timestamp. It then detects if the old serial number matches the new serial number, as you can see with the old and the new being bolded up. If the old the serial number has changed, I actually take the two new values and put them in a log table, including the command that ran it, which is this function right here. So I can actually capture the, the query that actually caused the data to change, and then I return it, and then life is happy. And down here is how you actually declare the trigger. So I can say create trigger, that's what it's called, before update on uh, this case is a table called serial numbers. That's not what it's called in the real system, but on serial numbers, for each row, it executes that function. So <clears throat> essentially what's happening is before a row of data is updated, after some does an update statement, um, and every row that's affected, it will fire off that function to log the changes to the database. Now, to explain why this kind of trigger is important, um, logging triggers one of the biggest uses for triggers in databases to log changes to the database. Um, because triggers happen instantly. They're really, really fast compared to code execution where you'd have an application that, you know, inserts, a, you send out two database commands or three database commands to do the same thing. This happens all in the background almost instantly. Now, nine years ago, roughly, um, I received a call from my former employer which is now my current employer. I had a little, I took a two year break. And I get a call from them saying, Dan, serial numbers are changing in the database and we don't know why. We're like, okay. And how, I said, so they had rolled out a registration system that I had written years ago for one specific customer and they had expanded it to a bunch of customers. And the person who implemented it didn't know how to do web development safely. Uh, they were really good at copy-pasting my code and changing things, but they didn't understand the implications of what they were doing. So what was happening is we had somebody coming out of a Tor exit node in Amsterdam. Now, most of you don't know what a Tor exit node is, but those that, the, how many of you in here know what Tor is? One, two, three. Tor, yeah, Tor. No, Tor, the Onion Router Project. 
the I don't want anybody to know what I'm doing project. Right? It anonymizes everything you do on the internet. And dude had written a bot that was hitting our registration server, feeding it fake data, until he found a pattern that worked. And what happens on our registration server when somebody registers their software, it downloads an encrypted license file to their desktop for their application to run. He was trying to crack our encryption. So he figured out a way of feeding values into our system that would return license files. What he didn't know is that it was actually walking through our database product by product, changing the registered serial numbers for our customers. Now, I thought I fixed the problem and it kept happening. So I had to write a trigger to capture the old and the new so I could revert them, number one. Number two, I had to figure out where this was happening so it was capturing the queries. So I could search through all the source code these people had written to find the spot where there was a weakness and then fix that. And then two weeks later, I was at it again because dude was really clever. He made our system really secure. I also got the bill for like 40 hours worth of work, which was great too. Um, but, you know, I've always had an intense hatred for anybody using a Tor to access our system. Which is why I, we actually ban Tor from, if you're using Tor, you can't hit our servers. And there's a way for us to know if you're using Tor, by the way. It's really easy. You capture the list of exit nodes and you ban all those IP addresses. Problem solved. Um, so that's why this trigger came to be. It's a very short piece of code. I mean, realistically, you're looking at that gave us undo capability, allowed me to track inside the code what was happening, and it happened real time. So I could just keep an eye on that table, run it, run a query every half hour, see what, what was triggering the changes, and see, you know, what was outside bounds of rules. I added more rules to the system, like length of serial number checks, and, you know, this page can't be used unless you're with this application kind of thing, but that was what allowed us to actually bolt it down. That's what that's good for us. How do you think it works in the real world? Order comes in. Order entry puts it in. Order entry gives it to shipping. Shipping scans a dongle in, which goes into a, matches the serial number, gets put in the database record. Package goes out to the customer. Customer receives said package. He plugs in his dongle and says, you must register to receive a functional license. It reaches into the database server, updates the customer's record, make sure the dongle serial number matches, downloads the license file. Some of the stuff, you know, some of our license files go up by email, so really from the moment they place an order to when the customer gets it is less than 40 seconds. There's no time to keep two databases in sync that, because the two databases would have to keep itself in sync. Even if I had a second database that's isolated, which is probably what you're thinking of, if that database is isolated, how does it know what the real serial numbers are without copying them back into the system anyways? So yeah, no, it actually interacts with the database, that chunk of the database directly. Yeah, it's very sanitized now compared to how it used to be. But that's, yeah, if you're writing web apps, it's talk to your database. Yeah, it's called an injection attack. Yeah. No. No, he was doing a data exploit attack where he found a pattern in the data that worked and he started walking through that pattern. Uh, which, where you're heading to, it's a secure it's database security rule and I only have one phrase and I don't teach database security because that's really not part of this course because that's actually part of your web development course they should be taking. But if ever you write code that talks to your database that's accessible from the outside world, clean it before you stick it in. In other words, make sure the data is sanitized and there's no SQL in there, there's no random HTML before you shove it into the database. For those of you that didn't get the pun, just go think in the gutter for a minute and then you'll actually get what I mean. But that's essentially not far from the truth. Um, databases that aren't secure, might as well, it's like a glory hole. So it's bad if you're not safe. So make sure everything's safe and life is good. And <laughs> I will also post this on Brightspace so you guys have examples of what the code would look like. Question I'm going to have now, people are going to say, is there any of this going to be on the exam? No. Which leads me into 
the end of the term content. And the last nailing down, and I'll be posting this on Brightspace too, but I didn't post it because I want people to actually come today. <laughs> it's sad lecturing to an empty room. Okay. The exam, as I've said before, is 85 questions, but it's out of 80. There's five bonus questions. And the content is broken down as follows. Design theory. There's 17 questions about design theory. This covers things such as entities, attributes, the diagram notation. If you know what your crow's foot do, you're good. If you know what an entity, the definition of an entity or the definition of an attribute is, you're okay. If you know what an entity is, you're good. The slideshow cover, the slideshows cover an awful lot of that. If it's not enough, that PDF I gave you guys weeks ago is also good, or the suggested reading is also a good place to read. Not saying that the, con the questions are coming lifted directly out of that, because they're not, because none of it's required reading. But, you know, if you're looking for extra wordage to just bolt into your brain, there. Normalization, 17 questions. It covers, do you know what anomalies are? Do you know what keys are, as in candidate keys? That kind of stuff. What is the process, as in first normal form, second normal form, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And do you know what the definitions are, the first, second, and third normal form? Then there's physical design, 15 questions. That's the naming of objects. Now, by that, I don't mean the naming conventions. I'm talking, you know, must, can you use the same field name twice in the same table? Can you, use the, can you call two different tables the same thing? It's like as if you have twins and you call them both Bob. It's not going to work. Um, for those of us that are Canadian that are old enough, probably remember Daryl Daryl and my other brother Daryl. Oh, actually, that was actually an American show, but it was really popular in Canada. Yeah, that doesn't work. Um, data types, as in, you know, what are the common data types you'd use for things? Um, primary and foreign keys, as in, what are they? As opposed to candidate keys, which is part of normalization. Um, 15 questions on basic SQL concepts. You should roughly know what your create, alter, and drop commands are and what they do. No, I'm not going to ask you to write any of it because it's all multiple guess or true false, which is, again, just less than multiple guess. The select statement, as in what is the syntax of a select statement? You know, what's the character you use to select all columns? How do you pick out individual columns? That kind of stuff. The where clause. Pattern matching. What do you do with multiple predicates? You know, the brackets and the and and the or? That's the kind of questions you're going to get for that. Uh, advanced SQL concepts. 12 questions there. Covers joins, aggregates, grouping, and having, and subqueries. You should know what these are. You should roughly know what the syntax is. You should know how they behave. I'm not asking you to write any of it. I'm asking you to do it. The, the, the theory behind the language, not the, uh, the actual physical aspects of the language. That's what the practical's for, right? And then the bonus. Five questions in the bonus section. I give you a sample diagram, a very simple diagram. There's three tables on this diagram. No, I'm, you don't get to see it now. And there are five questions you have to answer based on that diagram. And it will help you demonstrate your understanding of basic design, database design theory. In other words, based on this diagram, what are the rules? So, is field A required? You know, or based on this diagram, could the field B ever be empty? Based on this diagram, can you add one of these without adding one of those? Those kinds of questions. In other words, based on the diagram, can you actually understand how the database is going to behave? It's only three tables. So it's not very big. That's the summary of what's on the exam. Um, so for additional information, the written exam, once again, 8 a.m. on a Saturday. <laughs> that should be fun. By fun, I mean it's going to suck for all of us because usually on Saturday I'm not up till 10. <laughs> so, you yeah, know, we're all be sitting here. I'll be sitting here drinking my coffee. You're allowed to bring a coffee. Okay, just saying. Uh, Coffee, clear bottles are good. It's open laptop, closed book. 
In other words, you're not allowed to be alt-tabbing out of the test. Um, yes, that's why I gave you the cards. Like, honestly, I could almost write enough on one of these cards with my own shitty handwriting to actually cover almost every topic. So the everything you need to know, you should be able to fit on one of these cards double-sided. Just think about what's important. Right? It's just like any kind of a test taking, right? You, you try to make sure you're solid on 80%, kind of solid on 10%, and hope you can guess the last 10. And, you know, I put 80% of the content that I think is important on the card. And that'll probably cover you more than adequately. Um, if your sh handwriting is absolutely atrocious, or you can't write, you write like a four-year-old where your letters are, this, are that big, yes, you can print and stick to the card, but the top part still has to be visibly yellow where the part I printed is visible. Okay, so you can still sign it. And I know it was actually one of my cards with a weird little curl to it. My printer did that and I couldn't get him to straighten out. So that's the theory exam. Um, other than that, make sure you take your bricks or make sure your laptop is fully charged. Because if your laptop dies partway through the exam, you'll just elicit a chuckle from me. Because I literally just told you, make sure it's charged or bring your brick. There are more than enough plugs in here to handle the situation. Um, I usually prefer you leave your bags at the front, but because you got your laptops with you, I prefer you at least put them under your desk or off your back, hang off the back of your chair, so that you know if you go reaching for stuff, it's obvious. Um, put your phone on do not disturb, put it off or leave it in your locker. All these things are valid choices. Um, hearing the phone go off partway through the test is not cool. Just saying, because like, it's happened before. And then everybody around you panics thinking it's their phone. Uh, yes, life may have emergencies, but if your phone's on a do not disturb, at least you know for the next hour you won't need to know about it. Um, so that's pretty much the rules of engagement for the, for the, written, for the exam, the, uh, the theory exam next Saturday. Not this Saturday, next Saturday. Um, The practical is to next Tuesday, 3 o'clock, in here. Once again, take your laptops. Make sure it's working, because it's going to suck if it's not working. Have the database, the flight DB, preloaded and ready to go. Maybe review the diagram. Even better, do the practice questions. They're not that hard. They're not terrible. And some of the questions are literally within 95% the same as what's on the test. So if you're able to do those questions, you should be able to survive. Uh, you got pretty much all week to get ready. So, you know, you've got a couple of lab periods practice if you don't understand. Um, so that's basically next week. Uh, now you're thinking, well, if you're having your practical test on Tuesday and your written exam on Saturday, what about... Wednesday and Thursday, those are the pity party classes. So if you did not submit a lab, you can come and see me, show it to me. I will not accept it electronically. I'm actually going to be locking those out soon. You have to come to me and show me that you did the work, and then you got to give you half marks. 50% is better than 0%, right? So if you can face me with the work you didn't do through the term when you had lots of time to do it, that's OK. Hybrids are due Friday. Just saying. Uh, lots of people have done them by now, so, you know, it's time. You had all term to do them. Except for the last couple, they're not that hard. Um, okay, that's the hybrids. That's the two tests. Oh, test two, by the way. Due Thursday. Drop dead is next Tuesday. Yes, I forgot to announce it last week, which is why I gave everybody an extra two days. Because I forgot and announced it, you know, a couple of hours later. I'm giving you guys two extra days of, to do it. So, you know. Honestly, I could have just sent out an announcement and said, here's your test, and just kept the dates as it was. But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, so far, only 31 people have done it. It's not that bad. 31 people have done it. The grades are fine. It's the same format as the original one. It is 10% of your grade. 
you know, you might want to do it. I'm not going to, then you don't get to use, you don't get to do the test of the pity party. That's not how that works. So that is it. That's the announcement. Other than that, there's not much else left to say as the content's been covered. It's been fun. I'll see you guys in lab and or your exams. And we're done. That's the end. <laughs>